Have you ever dreamed of living an idyllic existence under the waving coconut palms of a remote South Sea island? Of course you have. For ever since the onerous burden of civilization first began pressing its crown of thorns on the brow of romantic mankind. Who has not wistfully envisioned a trip across the languorous Pacific to find a tiny, lovely, lost coral island, to abandon forever the rigors of organized society, to loaf and sleep and fish and swim lazily, peacefully, and happily on the bounty of a glorious tropical nature? Well, here we are, on the morning of February 3rd, 1946, on this far-off Pacific paradise, over 4,000 miles from San Francisco. Is that remote enough for you? It's less than 600 acres in area. Is that tiny enough for you? There are only 167 human beings here, 60 of them children, all deeply religious Christians, converted by adventurous New England missionaries generations ago. From the coconut palms, the pandanus, and breadfruit trees, they get food, and the material for their dwellings, of which there are only 26. They depend on their own arts and crafts. They are proudly self-sufficient. They are astonishingly intelligent. They are a gentle and lovable people. They have boats, quaint outrigger canoes made of small pieces of strange woods lashed together with fiber. Yes, life is simple and beautiful on Bikini Atoll, until today, February 3rd, 1946, when there enters into Bikini Lagoon a fateful thing, a grim, huge symbol of civilization in its most terrifying form. Arriving is Commodore Ben H. Wyatt, United States Navy, with a startling request. Will the people of Bikini abandon their paradise so that the United States can use it for a certain experiment with the fantastic, the incredible thing called the atomic bomb? And after long conferences, it is to King Judah in public meeting that Commodore Wyatt puts the direct question. All right now, James, will you tell them that the United States government now wants to attempt to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind, and that these experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction? <laughs> Now then, James, they have heard our plan. Will you ask King Judah now to get up and to speak here for his people? We will try to go and everything good and everything in God's hands. Tell him that's fine. Everything being in God's hands, it must be good. Now Commodore Wyatt must look for another island, an uninhabited island, with sufficient resources to give the people of Bikini a new home, near enough and yet far enough away to be safe. He finds it in Ronjerick, slightly smaller than Bikini and some 175 miles to the northeast. And on February 20th, 1946, the work begins of preparing Ronjerick for the reception of a whole people. And so back to Bikini to dynamite the coral reefs and make a channel for the huge LST to land. But while these 167 simple and unselfish human beings begin tearing up their modest households by the very roots, let's ask why. Why these people of all people must sacrifice their ancient heritage, their proud traditions, even their sacred burial ground to the march of science. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. When the Joint Army and Navy Chiefs of Staff decided to determine the effects of the atomic bomb upon the structural strength of ships and to discover the reaction of aircraft to atomic attack, necessarily at a spot distant from the world centers of population, they chose tiny remote bikini because of its excellent anchorage and because of its complete geographic isolation. The very nature of Bikini's minute place on the face of our vast and troubled planet will enable the Joint Army-Navy Task Force to obtain the maximum information in these tests. Out of that horrifying instant when this quiet, peaceful atoll is transformed into a hellish, roaring blast of ghastly power will come lessons that may determine the basic facts of atomic warfare. 
the future design of ships and aircraft, and the development of defensive measures should atomic warfare ever be used against the United States. And far more than this. For, concealed within the fiery terror that is the atomic bomb, are hidden the broader and nobler aspects of its mystery. The power for good rather than evil. The ability to save, not destroy mankind. To build him a whole new world of atomically powered peace. It is to this glorious opportunity that the humble Bikinians are contributing their little all. I wonder, would you so readily give up your everything? The next to last step before departure, when each family marks the coconut trees it owns with a bit of palm leaf containing the family trademark. These markers to be collected and counted so that on Ranjerik each family will be guaranteed the same number of coconut trees. And now the last step. When the traditional conch shell horn is blown to assemble the population for their last church service in their ancient home, their last tribute to past generations of happy life and living. First they sing their own version of glory to God in the highest. And then these God-fearing people repeat, as is their custom, their version of the Lord's Prayer. The final words spoken are something like this. We will now proceed to our new home on Ranjerik. I give you God's benediction for a safe journey there. And so, on March 7th, 1946, the people of Bikini join their pathetically humble belongings on board the cumbersome, yawing-mouthed hulk of LST-1108. And man, woman, and child, the people of Good King Judah sing farewells to their old home, singing hymns as is their custom always while sailing on the sea and grimly maintaining the deep emotional reserve so characteristic of them. For each one of these people has come to believe, without duress and with conviction, that their hegira to a new land is a holy pilgrimage for the good of mankind. In the background as they look their last is the USS Sumner, advanced geodetic survey ship, for sounding operations are already underway, preparing anchorage for the fleet of 97 ships that will be the target of the atomic test. 97 gallant ships coming to this lost pinpoint on the Pacific so that their destruction may feed man's insatiable appetite for more knowledge to build a greater life. And so to Ranjerik. Here, laid out by Commander Harold Greve, Chief Staff Officer, a plan has been drawn for the new settlement to be precisely like the plan of Bikini. Here King Judah is to assign the new houses to the various families. Houses half again the size of what they had on Bikini. And Judah smiles, for he remembers that, uh, since there must be a fly in every ointment, there were flies on Bikini. And lo, there are no flies on Ranjerik. And another problem that always worried King Judah on Bikini will never bother him here. For on arrival at Ranjerik, they found great cisterns constructed by sea bees, holding thousands of gallons of water, more than enough to last through the most parching of dry seasons. And there are more cocoa palms and pandanus trees here on Ranjerik. And the vegetation is more lush. Truly, Judah smiled. For perhaps there's to be a better life even than the peaceful, happy existence of Bikini here on this other lovely lost Pacific island. Especially when you get a little help from the awesome resources of a joint task force. So a tribute to the people of Bikini who have sacrificed their homes. A tribute to King Judah who said, if the United States government needs to use our home for the goodness of mankind, then by the kindness of God, we are willing to find homes elsewhere. But I wonder, home is home. And I wonder if these simple souls will not think quite a lot and for a long time about Bikini, knowing that never again in their lifetimes will they see the familiar green verdure, the white surf, the blue seas of their old home. A little island which has for so long meant so little to the world and now means so much. Bikini, the Atom Island. Yeah.